beside a war horse by Michael Morpurgo, first published in Great Britain, 1982, Edgemont, UK Limited, Chapter 9. We were led away by two nervous soldiers, down farm tracks, through orchards and across a bridge, before being tied up beside a hospital tent, some miles from where we had been captured. A knot of wounded soldiers gathered around us at once. They patted and stroked us, and I began to whisk my tail with impatience. I was hungry and thirsty and angry that I had been separated from my trooper Warren. Still, no one seemed to know quite what to do with us, until an officer in a long grey coat with a bandage round his head emerged from the tent. He was an immensely tall man, standing a full head higher than anyone around him. The manner of his gait and the way he held himself indicated a man clearly accustomed to wielding authority. A bandage came down over one eye so that he had only half a face visible. As he walked towards us, I saw that he was limping, that one foot was heavily bandaged and that he needed the support of a stick. The soldiers sprang back at his approach and stood stiffly to attention. He looked us both over in undisguised admiration, shaking his head and sighing as he did so. Then he turned to the men. There are hundreds like these dead out there on the wire. I tell you, if we had had one jot of courage of these animals, we should be in Paris by now and not slugging it out here in the mud. These two horses came through hellfire to get here. They were the only two to make it. It was not their fault they were sent on a fool's errand. They are not circus animals. They are heroes. Do you understand? Heroes. And they should be treated as such. And you stand around and gawp at them. You are none of you badly wounded, and the doctor is far too busy to see you at present. So, I want these horses unsaddled, rubbed down, fed and watered at once. They will need oats and hay and a blanket for each of them. Now, get moving. The soldiers hurried away, scattering in all directions, and within a few minutes Topthorne and I were being lavished with all manner of clumsy kindness. Uh, none of them had handled a horse before, it seemed, uh, but that did not matter to us. So grateful were we for all the fodder they brought us. And the water. We lacked for nothing that morning, and all the same the tall officer supervised from under the trees, leaning on his stick. From time to time he would come up to us and run his hand along our backs and over our quarters, nodding his approval and lecturing his men on the finer points of horse breeding as he examined us. After a time, he was joined by a man in a white coat, who emerged from the tent, his hair dishevelled, his face pale with exhaustion, and there was blood on his coat. Headquarters phone through about the horses, Herr Hauptmann, said the man in white, and they say I am to keep them for the stretcher cases. I know your views on the matter, Hauptmann, but I am afraid you cannot have them. We need them here desperately, and the way things are going, I fear we will need them more. That was just the first attack. There will be more to come. We expect a sustained offensive. It will be a long battle. And we are the same on both sides. Once we start something, we have to prove a point, and that takes time and lives. We'll need all the ambulance transport we can get, motorized or horse. The tall officer drew himself up to his full height and bristled with indignation. He was a formidable sight as he advanced on the man in white. Doctor! You cannot put fine British cavalry horses to pulling carts. Any of our horse regiments, my own regiment of lancers indeed, would be proud indeed, overwhelmed, to have such splendid creatures in their ranks. You cannot do it, Doctor. I will not permit it. Herr Hauptmann, said the Doctor patiently, he was clearly not at all intimidated. Do you really imagine that after this morning's madness that either side will be using cavalry again in this war? Can you not understand that we need transport, Herr Hauptmann? And we need it now. There are men, brave men, German and English, lying out there on stretchers in the trenches, and at present there's not enough transport to bring them back to the hospital here. Now, do you want them all to die, Herr Hauptmann? Tell me that. Do you want them to die? If these horses could be hitched up to a cart, they could bring them back in their dozens. We just do not have enough ambulances to cope. And what we do have, break down and get stuck in the mud. Please, Herr Hauptmann, we need your help. The world, said the German officer, shaking his head, the world has gone quite mad. 
when noble creatures such as these are forced to become beasts of burden, the world has gone mad. But I can see that you are right. I am a lancer, Herr Doctor, but even I know that men are more important than horses. But you must see to it that you have someone in charge of these two who knows horses. I don't want any dirty-fingered mechanic getting his hands on these two. And you must tell them that they are riding horses. They won't take kindly to pulling carts, no matter how noble the cause. Thank you, Herr Hauptmann, said the doctor. You are most kind. But I have a problem, Herr Hauptmann, as I am sure you will agree. They will need an expert to manage them to start with, particularly if they have never pulled a cart before. Uh, the problem is uh, that I have only medical orderlies here. Uh, true, one of them has worked on horses on a farm before the war. Uh, but to tell you the truth, Herr Hauptmann, uh, I have no one who could manage these two. Uh, no one, that is, uh, except you. Uh, you are due to go to base hospital on the next convoy of ambulances, uh, but they won't be here before this evening. Uh, I, I know it's a lot to ask of a wounded man, uh, but you can see how desperate I am. Uh, the farmer down below has several carts, and I should imagine all the harnesses you would need. Uh, what do you say, Herr Hauptmann? Uh, can you help me? The bandaged officer limped back towards us and stroked our noses tenderly. Then he smiled and nodded. Very well. It is sacrilege, Doctor a sacrilege, he said. But it has got to be done. I would rather do it myself and see it done properly. So, that same afternoon after our capture, Topthorn and I were hitched up side by side to an old hay cart, and with the officer directing two orderlies, we were driven up through the woods, back towards the thunder of the gunfire and the wounded that waited us. Topthorn was all the time in a great state of alarm, for it was clear he had never pulled before in his life, and at last I was able in my turn to help him, to lead, to compensate and to reassure him. The officer led us at first, limping along beside me with his stick, but he was soon confident enough to mount the cart with the two orderlies and take the reins. "'You've done a bit of this before, my friend,' he said. "'I can tell that. I always knew the British were mad.' Now I know that they are mad, for they use horses such as you as cart horses. I am quite sure of it. That's what this war is all about, my friend. It's about which of us is madder. And clearly, you British started with an advantage. You were mad beforehand. All that afternoon and evening, while the battle raged, we trudged up to the lines, loaded up with the stretcher cases, and brought them back to the field hospital. It was several miles each way over roads and tracks, filled with shell holes and littered with the corpses of mules and men. The artillery barrage from both sides was continuous. It roared overhead all day as the armies hurled their men at each other across no man's land, and the wounded that could walk poured back along the roads. I had seen the same grey faces looking out from under their helmets somewhere before. All that was different were the uniforms. They were grey now, with red piping, and the helmets were no longer round, with a broad brim. It was almost night before the tall officer left us, waving goodbye to us and to the doctor from the back of the ambulance, as it bumped its way across the field and out of sight. The doctor turned to the orderlies, who had been with us all day. See to it that they are well cared for, those two, he said. They saved good lives today. Good German lives and good English lives. They deserve the best of care. See to it that they have it. For the first time that night since we came to the war, Topthorn and I had the luxury of a stable. The shed in the farm that lay across the fields from the hospital was emptied of pigs and poultry, and we were led in to find a rack brimming full with sweet hay and buckets of soothing cold water. That night, after we had finished our hay, Topthorn and I were lying down together at the back of the shed. I was half awake and could think only of my aching muscles and sore feet. Suddenly, the door creaked open and the stable filled with a flickering orange light. Behind the light, there were footsteps. We looked up and I was seized at that moment with a kind of panic. For a fleeting moment, I imagined myself back at home in the stable with old Zoe. 
The dancing light triggered off an alarm in me, reminding me at once of Albert's father. I was on my feet in an instant and backing away from the light, with Topthorn beside me, protecting me. However, when the voice spoke, it was not the rasping, drunken voice of Albert's father, but rather a soft, gentle tone of a girl's voice. A young girl. I could see now that actually there were two people behind the light. An old man, a bent old man in rough clothes and clogs, and beside him stood a younger girl, her head and shoulders wrapped in a shawl. There you are, Grandpapa, she said. I told you they put them in here. Have you ever seen anything so beautiful? Oh, can they be mine, Grandpapa? Please, can they be mine? <laughs>